This morning's last presentation is um, Vincent Diviacci, who is technical manager for the Central Division for AGRU America. He's a uh, he's going to talk about geosynthetic closure solutions now with solar. <laughs> Thank you for the exclamation point. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, all. My name is Vince from Agri America. We're uh, manufacturers of geosynthetics. Um, I cover everything from the mid uh, Mississippi River and west and up into Canada. I'm based out of Chicago, so I came out here to lovely Montana. It's been different topography. I like it a little bit more. So it's been nice here too, meeting everybody. Um, cornhole is fun. Got fourth place, but you know, first place had about 20 foot fouls. <laughs> Nobody's counting though. Well, I'm not, not bitter at all, but well, there, there was going to be other year. So uh, this this uh, this presentation is going to be more focused on you know the closure side of things. You know, a lot of the presentation that Charles has had uh, showed you a lot of those nine ponds that use some of these same geo membranes and geosynthetics. So this is going to be more on the the, the final part of the, the conference where you're actually closing off some of these sites. I will do just an intro on, on agro and manufacturing just to see how geomembrane liners are made, um, go through some of the geosynthetic products that we have as well, and then jump into some of these partner products that you're going to see that are kind of newer to the uh, environmental world. Um, agro itself has been around many years, making geosynthetics since um, in the 80s. So geomembrane production would, for this region would be coming out of our Fernley, Nevada plant. So if you're ever in Reno, you want to pop over to Fernley, our guys there are always open uh, to doing little walks around the, the shop and seeing a uh, geomembrane production pretty cool facility. Um, nine, or there might be 10 production lines now for geomembrane. Um, you know, each of those make about a million square feet a day, so quite a bit of geomembrane that gets manufactured. Uh, we also make geosynthetic clay liners, uh, geocomposites, and uh, geotextiles as well. So, so quite a bit of plastics and geosynthetics in general. Uh, uh, concrete protection line is also a unique product. We see a lot of this in the mining world too. It's where you can actually take HDPE, um, have it embedded in the concrete, put the concrete behind it, it casts and cures, and now you have an HDPE protected uh, concrete piece. Uh, large diameter pipes, they make the largest pipes in the world, 10 foot diameter, and I think 2,500 feet long is the longest. You can see the picture on the left is um, there's, there's tugboats that are tugging these pipes to a desalination plant in the Philippines. And then uh, pipe fitting is also pretty common. So this is just to get a taste of the, the variety of plastics that we do manufacture. Um, quite a bit of experience in all that. This will be more focused on the geomembrane side. Um, so high density polyethylene, linear low density polyethylene. Those geomembranes are most common in, in this market in the environmental world. Uh, smooth textured, conductive white. So all, all different types for, for different applications that you might have. Uh, production, this is what we have at, at both our facilities in South Carolina and in Nevada. Uh, this is a flat cast manufacturing process, which is unique to the industry. Uh, a lot of other geomembrane manufacturers make uh, blown film production processes. Uh, you can see with ours in the in the background is where the actual feed mix is going in. Um, the resin is getting mixed with the, the additive package and the carbon black that gets all melted into a, um, these rollers that, that then produce the sheet. And in the foreground, you can see the uh, that's the actual geomembrane width, so 23 feet wide for each roll. Um, depending on the thickness of the material, they can be you know, from several hundred, like 500 feet long to thousands of feet long. So quite a bit of product that's made per roll. I'm just giving a little schematic here. The, the feed, feed lot would be coming here. We have the ingredients for the geomembrane. When it goes through the extruder, hits the flat die, and this is your geomembrane sheet. Um, if you have those, these layers are what make uh, agro kind of unique and it gives us a lot of variability in our manufacturing processes. The, uh, the layers we can change out some of the smooth joint layers or textured or structured, uh, depending on what layer we put in, is the product that comes out and gives you your finished good. And all that is spark tested there for any holes or defects. So everything that leaves the shop is hole free. Um, this shape, this is the uh, structure that we can make. You can see here on the other side, this is a drainage component to a gene membrane. Uh, these spikes here, these would be actually going down into the subgrade. Um, this would be used on very, on stepper slopes, applications where we have very high shear strength that's required. Uh, we'll go into that in a little bit of detail here. So some of the, the closure solutions, you know, these, these products, you know, many millions of square feet have been installed. Um, 
in this country and worldwide. In particular, these drilled, uh, structured ones that have the, the drilled studs here. Um, these are like about 250 million square feet since uh, 2003. And a lot of times we see clay caps still being um, selected for designs. And you know, over time, we just, I, I had someone emailing me yesterday from Minnesota and they have a clay cap that's been there for 30 years and there's this leachate coming out of the sides of it. So now for 30 years of leachate just popping through, they're gonna put a uh, membrane over top of it to cap it. So we still see clay uh, coming around, and obviously depending on the site and who's doing the work and just a lot more variability in, in a clay liner um, for a closure versus a geosynthetic. So uh, this, is, this is sort of the, the typical geosynthetic closure system, you know, your vegetative cover soil. Uh, your geocomposite here is serving as your drainage layer in place of uh, an aggregate or some sort of sand material. Um, and then you have your geomembrane here, so that's your actual barrier on the closure on the cap side. An alternative, you know, we saw this product earlier with the spikes on the bottom, your drainage studs on the top. You have versions that don't have the spikes, it might be smooth or just a simple texturing, but they, they would all have that drainage layer on top. And now you're going to put them down a textile, and then you have your same vegetative cover soil. So it's just a little bit different product that's going to get you, you know, more flow, prop, uh, more flow capacity and greater shear strength. So it just depends on, on the site you have, you know, which geosynthetic closure method you're using. Uh, this gives you a nice view of some of the closures. Um, this, this is the, these are the drainage studs on the sheet, and then you get about six inches or so of a smooth edge. And these are the, uh, this is the actual weld. So there's a big, uh, long um, fusion weld that goes there to make it now an impermeable barrier over the whole top. So the super grip net product is the one that has the spikes on the bottom. Uh, this is where it gets us to the much steeper slopes. Uh, this is when we want to get to the 30, 35, 40 degree friction angle. So now we're, we see a lot of this in seismic areas as well. Um, it's, it's actually these spikes are going down into the subgrade soil. And then you have your, your drainage layer would be the underside here. I wish that was flipped upside down, but well. Um, and then your textile on your cover soil. So this would be part of a closure system that might be on a one and a half or two to one type slope. So we kind of went through some of those advantages utilizing the, uh, the, these drainage structure, integrated drainage system products. Um, you're reducing costs on sites, uh, you're improving performance, and so kind of getting best of both worlds on that. And uh, these geomembranes you'll see are going to be components of, of the another closure system that we'll run into. Um, same thing we see it used in ponds, so sometimes you get a double line pond. So you have your geomembrane as primary, your drainage layer serving as leak detection, and then your, your geomembrane on the bottom. So a lot of different uses for it. And those same geomembranes are used in some in closure applications that are, are part of this uh, system called um, closure turf. So agro manufacture the geomembranes. Watershed Geo, you're going to see their name on a lot of this. Watershed Geo is a partner company of agro that um, developed this entire closure system. Now I'm doing lasers down here at this one. It's not working. Uh, so this is a nice little cross section of the of the actual closure turf system. So Watershed developed this product, and it's a this is the gem membrane that Agri makes. And then you're going to have your your synthetic turf here, and that engineered synthetic turf is has these polyethylene grass fibers. Uh, those grass fibers are stitched down into a woven textile backing. You can't really see the backing, but it'd be down in there. And then there is a sand infill component that's brought in site and then groomed into the actual turf. Um, and that sand infill, depending on the site conditions and you know how steep you're looking at and, and how much rainwater you might be expecting, that, that type of sand can can vary. Um, but the big the big use for that sand is UV protection. So it's UV protection only for that woven textile backing. If it's left exposed, you, know, you might get 20 years out of it, but once you get the actual sand over top of that woven backing, now you're talking hundreds of years. Um, and as I discussed earlier, those geomembranes that Agri makes, these are the few different types, um, depending on how much drainage you have. You know, this is just a regular LDP geomembrane. This might be a pretty flat site, drier area that doesn't expect a whole lot of rain and rainwater infiltration coming in. Um, this one would have a textured bottom and a drainage layer on the top side, so that's when you're getting you know 
five to one, four to one type slopes. Um, the super grip net would be the other one, the far one here with those spikes. And that's when you're going to have some drainage on the top side, but you're going to go, you stick that right into the subgrade, and now you're hitting your two to one in steep slopes. Uh, it's still white. I'd like to make note of that. So if that, that turns green, it'll be nice. Um, and, uh, you can see there's, I think they're up to, uh, there's a couple, few hundred acre sites that they have orders for this year. So there's, they're up to about 4,000 acres on um, the whole projects now. And you can see it's it's um, all over the U.S. that they're using it. Uh, I know they've done some sites in, in Africa too. So it's, you know, closure turf is, is getting to be pretty common now. Um, it's good these conferences are, where, you know, engineers see it, regulators see it. It just becomes more more common and more, more appealing now that the, some folks know about it. Um, applications, you know, why are you going to use a regular right? this synthetic turf instead of a, a, a grass or a clay type closure system? So you know, we really have lots of folks that they have issues with erosion or just getting some vegetation to grow over top. You know, they don't want to work a lot of private smaller landfills that just don't want to deal with maintenance. So they put this on top so they don't have to mow it. They don't have to worry about erosion. Um, sites in the southeast, you know, they get some hurricanes blowing, blowing through and now they're going to have quite a lot of deterioration on their caps. So lot, lots of different reasons why to, why to go with a closure turf product. Uh, the installation process is pretty simple. You have your, your subgrade is prepared. Um, your geomembrane comes in. You do play your geomembrane. This is the point three feet wide, you know, up to 800, 900 feet long. So they roll that out. And then they cover up the welding equipment. They do their geomembrane welding there. Uh, the turf would be uh, the same contractor, installation contractor that does the membrane would come in and do the closure turf. Um, so that turf component is put in here. Um, you got your same weld over here with the synthetic turf. You use your heat welding, so everything is heat welded. And then the turf, um, there's no more sewing, so cross that out. But uh, then the sand infill comes in. Uh, the sand infill, depending on the site, you know, you might broadcast how you can broadcast it or spread it out um, if they're steep steep slopes you have to set up benches um, certain distance you know just to make sure you can get it down slope and then the goal of the method you know just brushing it in or grooming the sand and just so you get a good um, a nice spread uh, the sand is going to be five eighths to three quarter inch thick depending on the site so this is just some of some of those you know the cost benefits of, of eliminating maintenance Typically, uh, you know, I think it's going from like the hundred dollars per acre per year to two hundred, two hundred fifty dollars per acre per year, and we've had a lot of sites that are even less. So you know, maintenance, when it comes to closure turf, you know, there's there's no mowing, um, there's no erosion control, um, reseeding, fertilizing, and that. Um, there's you know pretty nice stormwater that comes off of it. There's hardly any fines or any any um, solids in it. In site inspection, depending on, on the regulator who you're working with, sometimes those site inspections are spread out to five years. Um, it'll just depend on, you know, if there's a major storm event, hurricane comes over, you probably want to go back and see if there's any, any major uh, damage done to it. Slopes vary, you know, depending on number is used and, and, and where the, the products being put in, you know, we do see up to one and a half to one type of slope. So we get quite a bit of turf going down in, in steep areas and seismic areas too. So we got a good performance there. And this, this is uh, one of the sites that shows it. So you do have two main slopes on the north side of the pond that yellow areas. So two main slopes there. And then we'll bring in with the, the flat cap. You can see these are access roads over top. Uh, benches built into. One thing you really need, which I sometimes forget to point out, is you really have a lot of rainwater coming off of this versus a soil cap. So um, any of your basins down at the bottom, all your, your rainwater is going to have to be captured, so you have to compensate for that when you're designing those. So here you can see you don't, you know, nice long slopes. You know, you get some some sites have 600, 700 foot long runs of a slope. Um, Three to one, and then you just have your normal access right on top, and then turf all over the, the rest of that site. And yeah, this is taking down the diversion berms. Um, this doesn't have any downslope channels. Some of those areas can be um, add a lot of cost to the construction, so this is saving more than just material. So design and construction too. And I was, I threw it out, there was questions about topography, you know, where it's used, and you know, mining sites. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of CCR, like, so like uh, coal combustion residual sites, uh, municipal side landfills, 
nice rectangular, so it's easy. Um, but with this product, you know, having the manufactured material, we get a lot of irregular sites, a lot of mining sites, and, and as you can see, closure of those is no problem. Cold weather, being that we're in cold, you know, everybody talks about hurricanes blowing over these things, and no hurricanes here, so um, we do have areas though where they do get a lot of snow and frost. And uh, there's been plenty of these sites, especially we, we have many of them documented in the northeast when nor'easters come run through and then freeze, and we had a lot of snow sitting over top. So this is Winter Storm Skyler, blowing quite a bit of quite a bit of snow there. So for the snow back in March, and then every, after all the snow melts, you know the concern is okay with the snow melt and ice falling down, is that going to be pulling a lot of that sand out or damaging any of the turf and pulling it out? And we haven't had any issues with that. Uh, there is a question that comes up, you know, right now the uh, the turf system, they, they give it 100 years on the half-life, um, or sorry, 100 years of warranty based on the, it hitting half-life around then. So it's still, we're still trying to do, to wait to like, extrapolate more data. Um, we have uh, turf samples sitting out at this facility in, in Arizona. This is where the highest amount of UV is hit in the U.S. So there's a big sampling area where people have textiles and clothing and paint. Um, and then just to see how long it lasts because you have the most amount of UV hitting it. And at that, at that area is where you know, we're trying to extrapolate the amount of years that we can get, get this. And um, right now, 100 years is, is the, the life that we're saying. Um, knowing that it is covering a geomembrane now, and that geomembrane is your barrier to, to keep any, anything from infiltrating the waste mass below. So that geomembrane barrier is being protected and is expected to last 400 years then or more. Uh, this is a nice little case study that we do at uh, Duke Energy. Um, one of our bigger clients down in the, in the south southeast. And they have this landfill, uh, Sutton, Duke Sutton. And at the Sutton plant in North Carolina, it's about 70 acres that they had closed with vegetative soil. So you can see it's this is uh, showing the vegetative cap um, after Hurricane Florence in 2018. So Hurricane came over and, and did quite a bit of damage. You could see that there's, this is looking down on those. You could see all the gullies and, and everything washed out like all throughout that cap. So gonna, they would have to come back in, re regrade everything, bring it up to grade, um, try to get it to seed again and vegetate again. Um, as you can see, there's you know, damage is quite extensive. So they came over to Watershed and Agri and they said, okay, how about now we look at this product, um, we wanna put this closure turf system on just to close this off and not have to deal with all that erosion year after year after all these storms coming through. So um, they came in, they did the closure turf system, but as they're putting the work crews putting the closure turf down, uh, Hurricane Dorian came in. So everybody has to leave the site. You got the uh, you can see it's not really finished here. You got your the, this area is all blacked out. So you got the geomembrane there, and then you can see the the line of sandbags that's lining this whole area. So they they did what they could. The crew did what they could as fast as they could to get this thing kind of buttoned up. But um, it's the turf isn't even anchored in anywhere. In some spots, it just has sandbags on it. But you can see this uh, area here. The sand, they weren't able to groom all the sand into the site to the hole, uh, to the turf. So they still have some sand that they have to go through, but the hurricane came over, everything stayed where it was, and crew just came back in and finished putting down the turf panels, finished grooming in the sand, and everything went back to normal. So quite a bit of cost savings there, and, and everything was, was clean and buttoned up right after that, that uh, hurricane. Uh, US EPA has also approved the product. I think we're doing our second phase at this Mississippi phosphate site. Uh, I think I have the video coming up here. But this is showing a little access road over top. I like to point that out. You're going to have that right here. Uh, this is all your geomembrane and then the turf coming in. This is showing that same site now with turf all over it. And then this video gives a nice little... Oh, yeah. Can you guys hear this? I think it's just there. I think it's down there. Oh. Sorry.
I don't even know where the audio is. Oh, there we go. And some cut bench to recover. And then we compare the costs and the operation and maintenance costs associated with the closure charge that we're using here. We sat down and discussed it with the EPA and the watershed deal. It was one of those folks that came in with the EPA and completely mitigated all of the leaching and the erosion that was happening. It starts with the two membrane binder. Provides high friction on the slopes and drainage on top. Seals a landfill, captures a gas. And then you overlay that with an engineered turf designed to last a very long time. That turf layer is covered up then with sand as a ballast material to keep it from blowing around. The big difference is they don't require dirt. We were going to have to bring in about 1.2 million cubic yards of cover soil, destroying good land to cover a landfill. That was going to require about 50,000 trucks. Everything that EPA does, of course, has to bring some sustainability. How can we reduce the carbon footprint of our remedy itself as we implement it? A big part of the drive is 75 to 80 percent reduction in carbon footprint. We've saved the U.S. taxpayers about six million dollars over the lifetime of this project. You don't have to water it. You don't have to mow it. You don't have to fertilize it. We are in the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We're right in the middle of Hurricane Alley. We've had dozens of hurricanes bear down on us so far. I'm sure by the time we're out of here, there'll be probably several more. We've been hit with tons of storms. The before picture of our system and an after picture. Thanks. It's the same picture. The EPA's adoption of this product sends a loud message. What I would encourage people to do and advocate is what we did here, is that do the science, do the comparison. The numbers were on paper, and we saved $6 million. Our choice was easy. Our to deal was absolutely wonderful to us. We wanted to make a long-term fix to where we don't ever have to worry about it. Our grandkids don't ever have to worry about it. Our great-grandkids, they stopped the issue, and I'm just very excited to be part of what their company has done for us here in Pasadena. Pretty cool video. That's Watershed Geo does that. That's not Agro. Agro's marketing is not as good as that. But um, now, I mean, the, the video is, is pretty good. It's on it's on the Watershed Geo website too. But it's it's just nice that the US EPA gives such a ringing endorsement of it. You know, the big thing is they talk about you know tearing up all this farmland that some sites look at doing just to get a vegetative soil cap, good soil, bringing in good soil to cover bad soil. It just doesn't make as much sense. Um, going from you know that closure turf product, it is the this is showing a little bit of it here. This is similar setup. It's membrane and your sand with your turf on top. Um, there's more sand here, and this hydro turf product is the same as a closure turf, except you have a uh, what's called a hydro binder within the turf. So it's it's the sand infill, but with a cementitious component. Um, Quick Creek makes it for them. Uh, it is that this this product is used where you have high flow applications. So if you're going to have uh, concentrated liquid flows, anything when you're 12 feet per second of water velocity or more, you know they've they've tested this to I think 40 feet or, or greater per second. So it's when you have quite a bit of liquid flow. This would be at your your down shoots and other um, high flow spots, and and it's used in place of concrete. Um, concrete uh, hard armoring application. So instead of having rip wrap and articulated concrete block, uh, this hydro turf is used. That hydro turf is also used on spots where you might have those one and a half, two to one slopes, and you don't want to have to worry about getting that sand to sit um, on those steeper slopes. You can use this type of hydro turf to keep that sand in place. So you see it on spillways. Um, a lot of mining sites will use it on spillways and, and down shoots, areas where they're gonna, they know they're going to have quite a bit of flow and vegetation is going to be hard to hard to hit. The nice thing with it is it keeps all the liquid on top, you know, with riprap and other things. You have liquid flowing around it, dislodging things and, and moving things around where in this in this spot um, all the water flow stays on the top side. Uh, this is just showing a down shoot where you're going to have your, your vegetative, your true vegetation on, on both sides of that shoot. Um, instead of bringing in any riprap or worrying about erosion down the center, they have the actual hydro turf is just anchored in on either side. And then you have your turf and your sand infill, and then your vegetation comes up and over. So just a, a way to get a synthetic closure and, and not worry about all the erosion coming through. This is another video, I don't know if you can play this one, it's just showing how fast the, this is Colorado State University. So they do this flume test. Um, 
And the flume test just showed that I think at about six inches of, of water per hour, um, that's when they start to have some of the fines moving. But prior to that, everything stayed kind of locked in and, and good to go under these high flow events. And they did max out the, the flumes at the Colorado State University. I think it's one of two in the world. Um, so that's that kind of buttons up the actual turf system um, in conjunction with closure turf. Now there's the solar component, power cap. Uh, power cap is used. It's taken solar panels that are available to the industry. Um, why power cap? You know, the power cap is using solar, putting it over top of these these closed sites. But you can avoid any of these types of issues with with ballasted systems or pile driven. Um, you don't have to worry about all the maintenance or underneath those panels. Uh, power cap does not penetrate the turf system. It has these these uh, friction strips and then these rails, and they sit right on uh, the the rails hold the solar panels. They're they're locked into those rails, and then those are laid out across the site, um, integrated into uh, um, the wiring and the circuit, uh, the combination box, and then this would be then connected into the grid. So we do have a lot of um, power utilities interested in this product. You can get you know two and a half to one is where they're comfortable with putting these um, solar panels. And they're used in place of ballasted like this. So this would be a ballasted system on a turf application. Um, what they do though, you get much more density than these panels. You can see there's some shading and some spacing in between. Um, now you're bringing in and you could actually get tighter spacing here and you can get on the side slopes. So you're going, you know, get one megawatt every six acres when you're five to six acres when you have a ballasted system. Uh, with this product, you're getting one megawatt every two acres. So um, quite a bit more density there. Two, two nab, there you go. So I know that's a, a quick way to look at it, but this this is a newer system power cap. Um, we have pilot projects right now, and then there's, I want to say, up to 400 acres that'll be put in next year, or letters of intent signed, and now they have to acquire all the solar panels, so that's kind of the, the big time constraint. But power cap's a newer product, and you know, hope to come be back here next year or year after presenting on that. Now that we're going to have some installs coming up. Um, this is my contact information, so I want to thank you all, but I do have a, a flight I'm catching after this, so I could take questions now, and then I left some business cards there if anybody has other questions that they want to ask afterward, but appreciate you all sitting in. Yeah, the uh, 2013, I want to say, was the oldest. Um, I know 2000, yeah, it was 2013 was the original. Um, the biggest lessons learned, we went from, on the actual turf, compo the turf component of the system, um, lessons learned, that was the question, what lessons were learned during from the initial installations. And it was, uh, the sewing was ditched. So there had to be a, a sewing process, and sometimes the actual stitching and the needles weren't getting through the woven backing. So now they found a, a welding method for that so they can use heat. Um, now that the seams, they figured out the seam side of things, the actual sand side of things was becoming um, a concern. There was um, the sand, at first there was more of a C33, a looser type sand with a lot of fines. And that sand, every time there was rain events or water flowing through, would wash out. So now they've, I think after the fourth iteration of sand, they, they have one that was um, specified this last year. And now with this higher gradation, less fines, um, uh, a lot more angularity, they have, uh, they've kind of knocked it out now where, where they don't have as much fines lost. Okay, we're big on lessons learned on closures in Montana. <laughs> Yes, there are. There's quite a bit of those on the western coast, I want to say. Um, they do high elevations, high wind areas. Um, the one, I can't remember where the site is in Idaho, but I, I was, I can't think of where it was, but I know it's in a lot of these areas that have uh, valley fills. Where is it? Kootenai County. Kootenai County, okay. So yeah, Kootenai County, is that way high up? It's, it's higher than Chicago, I can tell you that much. But yeah, I know they have a bunch of high elevation areas too.
planning are the typical post landfill land uses and what public involvement in any uh, was made in that or just how to decide on the cover cap and from that aspect um, like for so question on what is used post post closure how is the land used yeah yeah, post closure, it really does depend on site. We don't see as much reuse of the land from, I guess, commercial side or recreational side. So a lot of it is, you know, just a big open green area that is not accessible. And that's where we're, that's where I think that power cap component comes in to say, well, if you just have this landfill, which is a liability that you're going to maintain, turn that into a power generating asset. Okay. And it kind of, the land use afterward just depends on site by site across the country. Yeah, that's why I was wondering if the public had any input into it or if there was any consideration that way. Yeah, it's, um, it's being that this product is newer, it is, if the public did see this, I think they would, they can find some good use of it instead of, you know, having a, an area just kind of sit there, green turf, nothing coming out of it. If you can get some solar generated, um, it's good to have that renewable. Mm-hmm. So reuse of liners that have been installed before, like previously? Yeah. Um, a lot of the liners that have been used, some folks try to clean geomembrane liners that are installed in places, you know, maybe a pond or a temporary closure. Sometimes they put them on top of a landfill as temporary cap. Um, Cleaning them and reusing them is kind of challenging. Um, it is usually put back in a landfill. There are, I think there's two companies coming out now that actually want to take that in and recycle it and reclaim it and make it into pipe. Um, I don't know how far along they are, but I, I can't think of the big company that's backing them to do that, but I know they were launched this year. Not usually. If it's um, some some specifications, depending on the design engineer, we can mix it in with the resin that we do have. Um, depending on the site, we could get you know up to ten percent regrind. Put that back in. Anything we have internally, we can regrind and, and add back to the batch. Um, if we're allowed to have uh, recycled or reused resin come in, uh, it's more up to the design engineer if they allow it. Mm -hmm. I think that would also be up to the you know owner and site engineer. The big thing to remember is that you got the turf and the liner, so that this thick of a system, you know, you can't have someone coming in and putting a flag or a, a stake. And um, and I think that's the big concern is going on to a site. I've been to some hundred acre sites, and I'm like, man, you can play a lot of football games out here, and and it's just yeah, it, it's more the concern on that membrane being the barrier from infiltration. And uh, if there are any other questions, I know uh, Kit Hawkins back there, if you want to raise your hand, I'll volunteer you. He's with Northwest Linings, and they do a lot of liner installations and closure turf installations, and he has a booth here, and he's going to be here uh, for the show as well. And he loves answering technical questions like this. And he's the one that cheated in Cornhole. Thank you. Appreciate it.